The historians to be discussed in this presentation are Ronald Hyam, Robin Winks, Linda Bryder, Philippa Levine, Anne Laura Stoller, Durba Ghosh, Jane Haggis, and Edward Said. Writing in the 1999 edition of the Oxford History of the British Empire, Robin Winks observed that the impact of gender studies on British imperial history had not yet transformed the broader field. However, Winks prophesied that the influence of gender and sex history was bound to grow because of its interaction with literary theory and Edward Said's other. Beyond making accurate predictions about the foundations and future importance of gender history, Winks aptly identified Ronald Hyam's 1990 publication, Empire and Sexuality, as the instigator of a growing debate concerning sex and sexuality's place within the British colonial experience. In short, Hyam suggested that British imperial expansion was derived from the export of male sexual energy. Hyam received immediate criticism from feminist and so-called subaltern historians for his alleged superficial, phallocentric, and racially ignorant insistence on essentializing a dominant white male minority as the primary informers of imperial sexuality. In response to Hyam, feminist historians such as Catherine Hall, Jane Haggis, and Malia Forms, writing in the late 1990s, called for a more nuanced analysis of sexuality and empire. Haggis made a particularly important suggestion, proposing the creation of an imperial power matrix that would define how colonial relationships were shaped by contemporary notions regarding gender, race, and class. In response to Hyam's analytical inadequacies and building upon Haggis' methodological recommendations, historians such as Philippa Levine, Linda Bryder, Anne Stoller, and Durba Ghosh have examined various topics involving sex in British India, including sex in public health, the organization of prostitution, sexual relations between colonizers and colonized, and the relative influence of sex as an aspect of empire, but not as its driving force. Linda Bryder is a social historian of health and medicine from the University of Auckland in New Zealand. Bryder's work on sex, race, and colonialism attempts to summarize a new wave of research in the 1990s that challenges some of Haim's own work. She explores prostitution as a reality and a tool in British India, but as well as a curse. Haim's research on prostitution in India led him to find that it was a, quote, more honorable estate and that Asian prostitutes were likely to be higher up on the social scale, with education and proper training in their art. His comparison between prostitution, prostitution in the East as being inherently better seen than it was in the West is widely critiqued as being inherently Eurocentric. Bryder's research has led her to find that authors and scholars like Milton Lewis and Scott Bamber argue that although poverty fueled the supply of prostitutes, it also had provided women with new opportunities. Prostitution had enabled women to enter a market economy and gain economic independence from traditional social roles. With prostitution quickly becoming a reality of British India, the advent of sexually transmitted diseases also came with it. As easy as prostitutes were vulnerable to receiving and transmitting diseases, they eventually transformed into agents of disease prevention. In Britain, Contagious Diseases Acts were popular and passed regularly in 1864, 66, and 69. These acts intended to curb the spread of diseases among the armed forces. In Britain, the police were now allowed to detain women suspected of being prostitutes in order to perform examinations. This new power granted to the, so to the local police created an extensive network of social control. In India, only two measures were passed in order to control the spread of venereal diseases. The Cantonment Act of 1864 was where prostitutes were divided into two classes, where public prostitutes frequented by Europeans and others. Only the first group was required to register with the cantonment authorities and to undergo monthly medical examinations. The Indian Contagious Diseases Act of 1868 provided for the supervision, registration, and inspection of prostitutes for major Indian cities and ports. The Indian Contagious Diseases Act of 1868 did not last. It was dismissed in 1888 for lack of popular support. According to Linda Bryder, the early 1990s marked a shift in the type of research that was done in medical history in British India. Though she does not agree with Ronald Hyam or his research methods, she agrees that he laid the groundwork for the years to come. Durba Ghosh's monograph, Sex and the Family in Colonial India, first published in 2006, builds upon the methodological suggestions of historians such as Jane Haggis to challenge the argument that changing racial perceptions in the 19th century produced anxieties about interracial sexual relationships. As noted by Methali Srinivas, Ghosh's argument that although interracial relationships between white Britons and Indian women were common in the 18th century, the women in these relationships were conspicuously absent from British representations of empire. By analyzing the absence of Indian women in both literary and visual sources, 
Ghosh concludes that interracial relationships carried a similar social stigma in the 18th century as they did in the 19th. Ghosh adheres to the notion that race, gender, and class all played a role in colonial sexual experiences. Thus, instead of creating dichotomies such as sex between colonizer and colonized, she identifies three types of relationships and importantly indicates that women who lacked formal positions of power were able to engage with the discourses of the colonial regime in India. Sex in the family in colonial India makes an important contribution to the history of sex in British India because of its attention to, its, to the condition of Indians who were previously voiceless but retained their agency under British imperial rule. Ghosh also breaks down the chronological distinctions between 18th and 19th century attitudes towards race and sex that portrayed Indian sepoys and white women as catalysts for the segregation of sexual relationships along racial lines. In her essay, Sexuality, Gender, and Empire, published in 2004, Philippa Levine challenges Ronald Hyam's assumption that sex is the driving force behind the creation of the British Empire. Rather, Levine argues that sex and sexuality was the object of perennial concern to the imperial elite and something that they actively sought to control. Rather than limiting her study specifically to the Indian subcontinent, Levine treats the issue of sex and the British Empire in a much more general sense. Levine argues that as the British encountered sexual mores different from their own, it became part and parcel of imperial policy to corral and restrain these practices before enforcing British cultural standards and morals upon indigenous populations. Levine links this policy with the inherent beliefs surrounding race and sex within the British Empire. Sexuality to the British was something of a double-edged sword with the possibility that interacting with local cultures and their sexual mores could corrupt and debase Britons far from home. To prevent this, Britain had to export its sexual mores to the peoples it ruled. Anne Laura Stoller, a professor of anthropology and historical studies at the New School for Social Research in New York City, explores the relationship between sex and empire in her book, Carnal Knowledge and Imperial Power, published in 2010. Her research mainly focuses on how sex became less of a private affair and more so a public concern for the imperial powers and their ability to maintain a sense of dominance and control in conquered territories in the 18th to 20th centuries. Stoller states that the personal was highly political, and thus sex and empire building went hand in hand as European powers sought to integrate themselves into the personal affairs of their colonizers. Stoller addresses critical questions such as what affections were and were not acceptable forms of intimacy on colonial soil, why sex was a serious concern to the polit politics and policies of the time, what boundaries were there between local populations and the European men, and why was it so important to clearly define the ruler and the ruled in regards to sexual relationships. While she surveys a range of ways sex played a significant role in colonialism, such as regulating prostitution, mixed marriages, racism, and the introduction of European women in the colonies. She opens up a discussion on the sexual metaphors that previous scholars have attributed to the, acts, the act of colonization in general. Stoller comments on Robert Hyam's perception that colonialism was and is closely linked to the male sexual energy, as well as Edward Said's implication that a connection can be made between European men asserting their authority over Oriental women and having women yield to their sexual urges, and European attitudes towards Asian colonies in which the Europeans portrayed themselves as superior to Eastern cultures. Stoller states that perhaps these perceptions misconstrue the case, but one thing is clear. With the sustained presence of Europeans in the colonies, sexual prescriptions of varied sorts and targeting different actors became increasingly central to social policy and subject to new forms of scrutiny by colonial states. In conclusion, the connection between sex and empire is not a new concept, and scholars, such as those mentioned, have opened up the debate for understanding what role sex plays in maintaining imperial racial hier hierarchy and controlling a mixed population of Europeans and Indians. As Stoller suggests, despite the colonizers' efforts to regulate who slept with whom or interacted with whom, sexual desires transgressed racial boundaries, class boundaries incited purient desires. And this, in turn, made sex an integral part of col colonialism.